Okay, welcome. It's seven o'clock, it's um, Monday night, and it's existentialism time. Uh, today's lecture, Telos, Mediation and Transcendence. Um, we'll be looking at Kierkegaard's concept of the teleological suspension of the ethical. This is perhaps the most famous concept that comes out of fear and trembling, apart from, of course, the leap of faith, the other extremely famous concept that has probably entered our everyday language in many ways. So today we're going to look at this notion of telos, mediation and transcendence. The first section of the lecture, however, I want to address a couple of questions and points that were brought up in the seminar last week and respond to those. Um, at the end of the seminar, I ask people to sort of mention themes or, or problems or questions that they might want me to look at. And we have four of those that came out of that. And I'll just briefly deal with some of these as the first part of the lecture. The second part of the lecture, we'll begin looking at mediation and then we'll finish with a few comments about and a few thoughts about subjectivity individuality um, so uh, for this first part which we, we should try I'll try and take a break every 20 minutes or so you know um, but we'll see how we're going so for the first part let's just deal with these issues that were brought up in the seminar the first one um, was a question of the absurd what, what is the absurd how does it work what's its role the second one was on the enormity of beauty and having an expansive vision. The third one was on the issue of a better world, um, faith in a better world, and the relationship to the shudder, whether it was a trauma. And the fourth was on the relationship to indirect communication. So let's just start with that notion of the absurd. And um, it's used, obviously, very heavily inside Kierkegaard's Fear and Trembling. Um, it's by virtue of the absurd. The phrase is that Kierkegaard... Um, or more specifically, Johannes Silencio, John the Silent, is by virtue of the absurd, John the Silent says um, that Abraham achieves what he does. Uh, it's by virtue of the absurd rather than by virtue of reason. Um, that's the distinction there. But there's something interesting that our Camus, who's very famous for articulating the notion of the absurd, absurd says at one point in his book The Myth of Sisyphus, uh, in a chapter called An Absurd Reasoning. And this is a little quote from him. Um, so Camus says, the theme of the irrational, as it, as, it, as it is conceived by the existentialists, is reason becoming confused and escaping by negating itself. The absurd is lucid reason, noting its limits. So what, what Camus is doing here, the theme of the irrational, as it is conceived by the existentialists, is he's comparing his concept of the absurd with the traditional or the existentialist concept, which he's critiquing. And he's critiquing, and he critiques Kierkegaard, and he critiques existentialists for um, kind of having their cake and eating it. So they want to have this relationship to reason in which there's a kind of limit point or there's a problem with reason when it encounters the individual. Um, and yet they also want to kind of have this capacity uh, to go beyond somehow, um, uh, to transcend um, and Camus doesn't think this is a, a viable option. In fact, he says something about the leap. He says it's not a matter of being able to take the leap, it's being able to stand on the edge of the abyss where you would take the leap. Um, and he has this kind of uh, idea that existentialists are, you know, um, constantly talking about the way in which the individuals escape reason, subjectivity escapes reason, and yet somehow um, uh, reason itself is a kind of way of propelling us into the transcendent. And... Um, Camus' notion of the absurd is a bit different to this. For Camus, the absurd is uh, only present when the human and the world are present. And there's a kind of um, tension between the relationship of the human, the meaning-creating, reasoning being, and the world, which resists and doesn't seem to subject itself, or doesn't seem to be capable of being subjected um, by reason. So for Camus, there's a kind of absurdity in um, something like the way we think we can deal with the world and uh, inevitably think we can deal with the world and there's a kind of you know absurdity that we encounter as that um, that thought of how we can deal with the world is shown to be by the world itself uh, false and what these relationships to the absurd do they kind of around the notion of the absurd we can we can identify different tendencies or tensions within existentialism and in particular, there's a tendency or there's a tension inside existentialism, different different ways of approaching the question, if you like, of the relationship between the rational and the irrational. And on the one hand, um, we might ask whether the, the irrational arises precisely out of the rational, as its kind of inverse, as a kind of negation of the rational. 
and this is one of the things I think Camus is referring to in that quote, just to remind you, this is Camus' quote, the theme of the irrational as it is conceived by the existentialists is reason becoming confused and escaping by negating itself. So that escape by negating itself is the production of this kind of negation of rationality, a form of irrationality that is the opposite or negation of reason. But there's another notion of the irrational, which is not um, one that, as it were, results from having reason, but is a kind of different separate force completely, one that is outside of reason, um, is not irrational because it's um, the opposite of reason but is irrational because reason has no grip on it it can't access it it can't control it it can't deal with it um, and this other notion of of the irrational somehow outside of reason um, is perhaps one we might find more closely uh, aligned to psychoanalytic kind of techniques or notions of id um, those kind of things where the irrational is a sort of separate force in the world um, not, not entirely or not always a natural force, but that kind of dynamic. And so, for the absurd, for the absurd, the, if the if the absurd is understood to be in a sense a result of the you know negation of reason, then we're going to have a different kind of concept, one that's that's you know uh, aware of its limits, but also thinks it can transcend those limits. Um, if the absurd is like Camus, a kind of tension between two different forces, then there's not really going to be the same kind of um, capacity to transcend the limits. There's going to be an encountering of the limits, but reason is going to have no capacity to kind of transcend them. Um, there's going to be no ability to go beyond. So the absurd is a kind of, um, uh, not a, I would say a lightning rod. It's a kind of one of those key concepts used differently by different existentialists and related very care heavily to um, the role of the irrational, where where it's coming from, its source, if you like. Uh, that's moving on to someone asked a question about the enormity of beauty and the expansive vision and here it's worth thinking about a, a threefold distinction that, that Kierkegaard makes um, it's perhaps not as clear as it could be in Fear and Trembling it's primarily made in other texts and I can dig out bits and pieces if people want to look at it but this is a distinction three, a threefold distinction three levels if you like at the bottom is the level of the aesthetic um, which we might think of as the level of sensation Above that is the level of the ethical, and then above that, again, is the level of religion. And at the level of the aesthetic, um, where we have what we might think of, um, I suppose, as, as an experience, more commonly, uh, then obviously we might encounter beauty, we might have an experience of beauty, um, we might encounter something, uh, in a sense, that kind of catches our eye, um, but essentially we're generating here on terms of we're generating here responses sensation responses that are kind of pre-intellectual or sublinguistic um they're not really responses uh, that involve the intellect at all or the mind enormously they're they're responses of pleasure or pain that's nice a kind of feeling of warmth or a feeling of resistance or revulsion those kind of responses that you might have to um beauty or a piece of art for it say and once we move up to the the ethical stage however the responses kind of alter uh, and this is this this change in in what things look like and how they are at these different levels is going to be a theme that we need to think about with Kierkegaard. It's going to go on all the way through. But if we move from the aesthetic, where we're encountering the artwork, let's say, or the beautiful object purely at a sensory level, at the level of the ethical, we now encounter um, the beauty or the artwork perhaps at the level of a kind of cultural relationship. So even if we look at the Lascaux paintings, you know, 30,000 years ago, uh, the paintings that are made in the caves by early men, um, early humans. The relationship there is not just, you know, one of sensation of, um, you know, it's pretty, they look nice, oh wow, you know, all those kind of things. Yeah, it's not even the relationship that Picasso had when he saw the Lascaux, uh, the, the animals that were painted at the Lascaux caves, which is we've invented nothing, you know, by which he meant his own kind of work. Um, it's it's what's more important is in the sense that what we perceive in that moment is a kind of culture. We see something that looks a little bit like uh, um, the distinction from a purely natural activity into something that looks somehow, um, let's not say unnatural because it's not, but somehow involving a different level of forces, one that we might normally call culture. So at the aesthetic level, we encounter the beauty just purely sensory, and then at a different level, the, the ethical, we encounter beauty um, perhaps as a kind of sign of culture, uh, something else going on, 
And then again, at the religious level, we might encounter beauty, the enormity of beauty. And this phrase that the person used when they were talking to us in the seminar, the enormity of beauty, the expansive vision, almost seems to want us to push to this last, this final, this religious level, at which, obviously, um, we're not necessarily talking about organized religion here, but we're talking about something that we might want to use under the name of the divine. So in, in the work of art, in, in the artwork... We encounter not just a sensation, not just a relationship to culture, but we actually encounter something um, created in such a way that it couldn't possibly come out naturally. It's a kind of um, pure creativity, a pure creation, something of the divine. Obviously, the divine is you know, taken in this sense of the kind of power of creation, I would say. Now, what, what, what this sort of suggests is if we're going to think about something like beauty, then one of the things that's clear from Kierkegaard, and this may be, you know, um, maybe there in other people as well, is that obviously he's got these various different levels. And this is going to be important, not just for the question of beauty, but for a whole series of other questions with regard to Kierkegaard. He has this series of levels, the aesthetic, the sensory or the sensation, then the ethical, where we might find the universal culture, language, things like that, and then the religious above this, where something like the divine or something, as we will find out, like the essence or the truth of subjectivity will be found. As we move from the individual at the bottom, that kind of experience that the individual has through the universal, um, and that which kind of makes us human, if you like, makes us a category of the human, makes us something more than just an individual like body amongst a mass of other human and, un, and un, non-human bodies. So we go from the individual up to the universal, and then we have this third level, the singular, um, which is at the level of the religious. Um, and that level of the singular is the level of the person. So at each of these different levels, there's a kind of different way of describing things, and there's a different set of relationships that occur. So in terms of the question of beauty, it would be different at each of those levels, and we would try and identify what it would look like and how it would operate at each of those levels. The third thing that someone asked me to comment on was the idea of the better world. Now, one of the things I said towards the end of the seminar last week, and I'll repeat it here in the lecture, is that the question of faith that Kierkegaard poses to us, um, whilst obviously framed in terms of Christianity and religion, uh, has a wider implication. And one of the implications, um, perhaps, uh, this is sort of a kind of coming out, spinning off on some stuff, stuff that Deleuze says. One of the implications might be um, in relationship to the kind of cynicism that we see in the world and the capacity to believe in a better world, to have faith, perhaps, in a better world. And here I'm reminded of the words of Angela Davis, um, the American communist and revolutionary, um, who says that you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world, and you have to do it all the time. And this is a kind of like um, statement of something very akin to this relationship to faith. I mean, there's there's a lot of other stuff kicking around in that particular statement because of the act as if phrase, which has a lot of complications around it. Um, but this kind of uh, you know need to believe, the capacity to believe in a better world, as a as a primary starting point for a kind of politics. In the case of Angela Davis obviously one that's transformational, but that, that need to have the capacity to move into a position of believing in a new world before you can actually engage in any of the rational activities that might come out after that. So how you then go about perhaps trying to transform the world um, obviously might come down to a series of long arguments and discussions and analyses of various different theories of change, let's say. Um, but the capacity to even believe in the world being able to be changed um, Obviously, that's that's a prerequisite before we can actually argue about stuff, before we even think about how we analyse the world. So that kind of distinction between that prerequisite, that, that need to kind of move yourself into a particular kind of frame of mind or starting point um, before you can even begin to engage reason, that's kind of the, kind of the lesson, I think, that we can begin to think about, or at least one of the lessons we can begin to think about in a kind of... Um, non-religious way, I feel like, um, drawing on the works of Kierkegaard here. And the person that was talking about that was also talking about the shudder. Uh, there's this phrase, this, this, this shudder of Abraham as he raises the knife to slice down Isaac, um, realising uh, all of the things, all of the things involved and caught up and contracted into that particular moment of the knife being raised above the head of Isaac on the Mount of Moriah. Um, in that moment, there's this kind of shudder Kierkegaard describes. 
And one of the questions was, was does this, is this, you know, is this akin to, or is this the same as um, something like the notion of trauma? You know, I mean, obviously it's, it, it's, it's presumably fairly traumatic for Abraham to go through this experience. Um, but I think there's an important distinction that we can make between what the shudder is and what trauma is. Um, and perhaps that clarifies a little bit uh, if we make that distinction, quite what Kierkegaard means by the shudder and why, particularly in Problemata 1 of Fear and Trembling, why he's constantly going on about this need to kind of engage in the movement that is necessary uh, to understand Abraham, not the reason, um, but the movement, why that movement is so central. So shudder, I would say, um, is when the body uh, gets an effect from the mind. Um, so in this situation, it's it's all of the implications, it's all of the uh, the futures to be and the futures that are going to be about to be extinguished. It's all of this kind of uh, encounter with with a, an understanding or an awareness or a reason about what's going on that in, in Abraham's head. It's all of this kind of mental activity, if you like, um, that produces the shadow in the moment. And so the shadow is a body effect. Uh, that's produced from a kind of reason, intellect, mind position. Whereas a trauma is the other way around. Um, a trauma is a mind effect produced by the body. Um, now, these mind-body distinctions that I'm using here, they're, they're pretty uh, bad in many ways. Obviously, there's really actually a much more complex interaction rather than a separation. But what I'm suggesting here is that the shudder is a kind of determination that essentially comes from let's say within um, it comes from a kind of encounter of the reason and the intellect with the body um, and it kind of comes out uh, from the inside whereas the trauma comes in from the outside um, and I think those can, different dynamics are important I think they're kind of crucial um, and I think they kind of speak to the role this ambiguous role that reason has inside existentialism because existentialism is not rejecting reason but it's 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 as as um, can be referred to it's exploring the limits of reason and the last uh, the last comment that someone wanted me to talk about uh, at the end of the seminar was on this relationship between indirect and direct communication which again is a kind of fundamental to the way in which fear and trembling works um, as as uh, is clear from the epigram at the start and as is clear from various other bits and pieces of writing that Kierkegaard makes um, fear and trembling is an exercise in indirect communication. Now, indirect communication um, essentially produces something like a lesson rather than a content. Um, now, <laughs> what I mean by that is it's, it's, it's intended to try and get you to learn something. It's intended to try and change your capacities um, rather than being intended to try and get you to possess something. Um, and so if if the content is that which you would possess there is no content that you can strictly possess inside fear and trembling precisely because the content is paradoxical um, and this is the content of this moment of Abraham's uh, encounter with uh, with the the impossible in some ways and so this this isn't gonna this isn't gonna be able to kind of you know and we're not going to be able to get a content out of this because reason is going to collapse as we try and specify that content. There's going to be all these problems, these paradoxes and aporias. Um, and so what we can do, or what Kierkegaard is trying to present to us under the authorship of John the Silent, is a lesson, a way of approaching and a way of beginning to learn about what it is that Kierkegaard's doing. Focus less on trying to pinpoint the content and more on trying to understand the movement. And there's the the wonderful kind of example of the ballet dancer who is able to leap, in, and in the leap itself, an example of the leap of faith, in the leap itself they can enter the pose. Um, and there's no kind of strenuous relationship. And it's that kind of movement, that practice movement, um, that Fear and Trembling is attempting to present to us. And I think, in a sense, that's the easiest way of understanding indirect communication. When someone is trying to present something to you that doesn't um, produce a straight content that leads to an end conclusion, what it does instead is produce a situation when you encounter that text or that particular lesson, which aims to produce a kind of uh, new capacity in you, but not that new content. So again, Indirect communication produces capacity, um, and it's more like a lesson than a content. But this, the reason for the indirect communication, and the reason why it's done like this, is fundamentally to do with this problem 
of mediation, um, which he talks about a lot, uh, particularly in Problemata 1, um, but it's, it, it goes all the way through the text and it will become very, very central in Problemata 3. And that's what I'm going to begin to look at tonight. Um, it's 20 past, uh, let's have a five minute break and then we'll come back and, and begin looking precisely at that issue of mediation. Yeah, so we'll be back at 7.25. I'm just going to go and get myself a drink. Oh, where are we? Okay, we're not back yet. A few more minutes. Get yourself your cup of tea. Have a stretch. We forget. We forget. Sitting there and trying to listen to stuff um, can be a bit tiring. I know it sounds ridiculous. People never believe intellectual work is actually tiring, but it can be. Um, of course, it's often just an excuse by somebody, but you know. But anyway, I do think it can be very tiring. So. Uh, Uh, if you have questions and you want to ask anything during the course of the lecture, you are welcome to do so in Twitch chat. You will need to follow the channel, and it, the chat is auto-moderated quite heavily. Um, so short questions if you have them, not essays, it won't accept those. And obviously it has profanity filters and all those kind of things. But if you do want to ask a question, as I say, you're welcome to follow the channel and um, 
pop it in the Twitch chat. You're also welcome, as I mentioned earlier, if you're not a Brighton, not a part of the Free University of Brighton, you're welcome to use the Discord linked on the Twitch page. Get in touch if you want to. Or you're welcome to just listen to the lectures and chat away amongst yourselves with some friends or other people who might be reading the book. We're reading Fear and Trembling by Kierkegaard. Um, and just taking through some of the key themes. Hopefully offering a bit of a help in terms of your reading it. Uh, I'll begin again in a moment. Okay, let's um, get this. Let's just uh, continue then. So, the first thing I want to talk about next. Um, now, the first thing I want to talk about next is is just a, a simple a simple clarification of what Talos means. Um, and at the heart of this is this concept the teleological suspension of the ethical. A strange concept, or rather a strange, um, you know, phrase. A strange, it's, it's a very complicated, jargony phrase when you first hear it. When I first heard it, it was like, oh, what the hell does this mean? How does this work? Oh my God, I couldn't even remember what the phrase was for the first, I think, you know, few months that I was looking at Kierkegaard and studying Kierkegaard as an undergrad. Um, kept forgetting what, what it was, you know, um, teleological, some, teleological something or other, that's what I would have in my head. But the teleological suspension of the ethical. Once we break it down, it's a relatively straightforward concept as it happens, but it begins with this concept of teleology. Now, if something has a telos, and I'm probably going to be repeating stuff that a lot of people maybe understand or know, but it's worth just going through this. If something has a telos, a Greek word, um, then it has a goal or an aim. So the telos of chess, for example, is checkmate, or the telos of attending university is to get a degree, or perhaps to enhance your life, or perhaps to develop your career prospects. Um, so the telos may be one thing, as in chess, or it may be a number of things. Um, maybe some, there may be some immediate, in, you know, um, part, you know, telos or immediate goal, a degree, for example, that's part of a longer term goal, your career. Uh, there may be intermediate steps towards your larger goal, perhaps. Um, but the character, and this is the point, the character of an activity depends on that telos. So obviously there's a different way, for example, that you might approach being in university if your goal is simply um, career prospects or to develop, you know, uh, to develop a, a good CV. You know, you may do a whole series of things. You may attend clubs. You may You may work in a particular way that's very different from someone who's essentially attending university um, with a kind of abstract free notion of learning uh, where they may read stuff that's not you know, the other person, this person with the abstract free notion of learning, they, they may read stuff that's not on the reading lists, they may wander around the library randomly picking up books that sound interesting, they may attend courses that aren't specifically connected to their degree or that don't have any immediately practical application to their CV and so the, te the telos the, you know, is, is kind of crucial to understand the way in which an activity operates or the character of an activity. Now we can also think about things like historical interpretations. Um, now one way in which we might read history is to read it in such a way that there's an implicit telos inside history determining the activity of historical actors and moments. Um, for example, we might read historical events as though they leave up, lead up to today in such a way that history is read as a kind of progress towards today or a kind of progress towards civilization. Now that implicit assumption that uh, what was going on in the past somehow leads up to today or produces today, this is, um, on the, this is a kind of teleological reading of history. And it's obviously a preconception of sorts. Um, 
it's an you know an implicit teleology can be revealed as hiding an implicit assumption and often an implicit assumption rather than an explicit one is unwarranted um, it's not been argued for it's been assumed and it's kind of been slipped as contraband under the under the uh, you know under the eyes of, of reason so uh, sometimes examining the telos of an activity particularly the telos of an interpretation for example when we come to academic work or historical work or something like that Sometimes examining the telos of an activity can be a useful critical analytical tool. So not just not just does the telos sort of depend and organise the character of an activity, it can also be taken like critically to see what implicit assumptions might be kicking around. Now in the case of ethics, obviously teleological suspension of the ethical, so the other concept here is ethics, that's how how, do, how does telos and ethics connect. Well in the case of ethics, the telos is the right thing to do. It's the good. You act, if you're going to act ethically, in such a way as to do the good. And that phrase there, in such a way as so as to do the good, um, that to do the good bit is the aim, the goal, the purpose, or in this situation, the telos. And so if you're acting in such a way, then you're acting teleologically towards a particular end. If you're acting ethically, then you're acting teleologically towards the end that is the right thing to do or the good. Now, most of the time, the telos of an activity not only implicitly determines that activity, but it also makes the activity into a means to an end. The means are then determined by that end. So telos is not just a kind of, um, you know, irrelevant or implicit assumption. It's not kind of, it's not, not a minor thing. The means are determined by the end. The end is the telos. So the telos is actually organizing the determining and determining the various means in which um, we are using to get towards that end. Now, is it a suitable thing to do? We might say, is it right, for example, to use violence to change society from a violent one into a peaceful one? Um, means, ends, arguments are often around this relationship between telos and means. The argument, for example, might be put that ends don't justify the means, which rests on the assumption that somehow means are, you know, the, the means being used or, or generally, you know, means in, in themselves are often incompatible with the ends to which they, you know, uh, explicitly state that they are directed. So we have a recognition that activities have something like their own telos, um, and the logic of the situation is that it will lead to X rather than Y. Um, when we're describing a particular sort of set of activities. Now, the ethical as a form of activity aimed at producing the good, the right thing to do, um, the notion of the good here is not an end outside of ethical behaviour. I mean, this is kind of curious. So it's not like there's some other thing out there that is, you know, the good, and then there are over here there's ethical behaviour, um, and we work out whether they're good means to the end. Um, this is not... Uh, this is not how ethics works. It's not that you do an act and is this a good means to an end. Um, the difference here is that the, the good, that, that aiming at the good, constitutes what it is we think of as the ethical. If, if what you're doing has no relationship whatsoever to the values good and bad, if it can't be described in those kind of ways. Um, if, for example, you're going for a walk down the road uh, and there's no relationship to anybody in that walk, you just simply go out your house, walk around and come back, as we've often been doing inside this particular lockdown situation, um, there's no, in a normal situation, no ethical relationship there. There's no good or bad that can be said. You know, you're walking around. You're not doing something that is necessarily ethical. In the situation of a lockdown, of course, going for a walk um, in the particular way in which you've been instructed rather than wandering around all over the place, there's a kind of intervention of ethics in that sort of situation. Now, the transformation of that going for a walk from being you know, a non-ethical situation into being an ethical situation is because there's been imposed upon the latter this relationship to good behaviour. What's a, Because there's an end. There's a clear end that is associated with the good here, that end being to minimise the spread of the virus, minimise the spread of COVID. Um, now, generally speaking, when we're talking about ethical actions, what we have to understand is that the good here is a kind of, it does not come afterwards. Ethics comes only on the basis that the good can exist. If there is no possibility of the good, then there's no possibility, for example, of ethics. Now, the universal nature of ethics, and this is the other thing that's kind of crucial here, is, is ethics is, is something that we can share and that is, uh, is not solely individual. The universal nature of ethics 
is founded on something like the following, that the idea that the right thing to do, the good in the abstract, if you like, the right thing to do is not just going to be right for you, uh, the individual or the singular, but it's going to be right for all people in the same situation, for anyone capable of being held to be ethically responsible. Um, and in this situation, the ethics, uh, the ethics are, are universal. They are capable of being explained. They apply it to anyone in the, in the same kind of situation. You can you can explain yourself because other people can put you in put themselves in your shoes, and other people can understand. And you can be held responsible for your actions precisely because you can explain them. There is a possibility that you can give an account of why you behaved in the way you did. And so the ethical is a kind of moment at which a particular level, a particular framing of activity takes place and a particular organisation of that activity um, into a di kind of directional relationship, uh, uh, one we can value as successful or unsuccessful, good or bad, depending on how close it achieves the end of the good. Now, obviously, there's a huge amount of problems and constitutional issues as once we actually try and establish, you know, the rules of ethics. But we won't. We're not going to get into that at the moment. For now, just remember the idea that if it's if it's something that is, is claiming to be part of the ethical realm. Um, then the person who claims that will be able to explain it to you. They'll be able to use language to explain and justify their actions, give an account of their actions. And so that capacity, that in that relationship is crucial. Now, if Talos is the end towards which activities of go, and they also constitute and, and organise the character of particular kinds of activities, uh, so the two different students, for example, have two different kind of characters of study, um, or the ethical realm itself is is characterised by the existence of the good and as its as its primary goal. Um, if the, if that's if that's the relationship of telos and that kind of organisation of the ethical under a teleological relationship to the good, what is suspended when the teleological suspension of the ethical takes place? Well, what's primarily suspended um, is uh, the appropriateness of the level of ethics, the appropriateness of the level of the good and the bad as ways of describing our activity, our behaviour. Um, what's going to be, what's going to take place is, is, is there's going to be this shift to a different kind of level, a shift to a different framework. Now remember, before we got into the uh, the question about telos, I mentioned this this relationship between the aesthetic, the level of the aesthetic, then the level of the ethical, and then the level of the religious. This kind of moving up three levels um, that, that that Kierkegaard talks about. And so, prior to the the ethical level, in this aesthetic level, there's no question of the good and the bad. It's just a series of behaviours. Um, perhaps we can describe them functionally as, as whether they're successful or not but even then we would have to ask successful towards what end um, so we would still be talking about teleological so there can be a teleological realm here um, but it's it's not ethical there's no good or bad particularly here there's no there's no value judgments in those ethical senses are allowed there's just kind of if you like stimulus response situations or behavioristic kind of situations Above the sensory and aesthetic level, once we move into the ethical, things are reorganised and behaviours are now no longer looked at in terms of maybe stimuluses and responses or successes and failures, but they're now looked at on the basis of the way in which the ethical was constituted. Fundamentally, it's constituted on the basis of going towards the good, but the way in which that takes place, the way in which reason organises that is very different. For example, if you're Kant, it's very different from um, being you know, John Stuart Mill. It's very different if you're a deontologist, as we say, about Kant's people, um, which means duty-orientated. Um, deontic is duty. So a deontologist is organising their ethics around particular kind of duties. Um, duties that everyone in this in particular same situation would have universalized because of that. Whereas someone like a utilitarian is organising their ethical behaviour around calculations of the greatest good. Now they're they're both orientated towards the end that is the same, producing acts that are good, enabling us to act well, good. <laughs> 
uh, enabling us to act ethically. They're both doing that. They both organize themselves very differently. But they're even in their different organization, it's that relationship to the good that's organized the limits of their differences. They can't go beyond those limits. Um, they still have to account for, uh, you know, they still have to assume rather something um, that is capable of being good or bad. Now, at the realm of the religious, the realm of the divine, the realm that's somehow beyond or transcending the ethical, uh, this relationship to the good and bad no longer exists. This, this is, a, you know, um, a bad way of describing this particular level of activity. And the crucial question for uh, Kierkegaard is, if we try and understand Abraham within the framework of the ethical, we end up unable to understand why he would be such a prime example of Christian faith or of faith in any kind. What we see inside the ethical is someone who is willing to commit murder. Um, what we see inside the realm of the ethical are actions that seem inexplicable in terms of the good. They seem unable to be organized into a framework in which in any way whatsoever they can be kind of placed into uh, a chain of activities that leads towards the good. Um, and they kind of, as it were, exemplify a, a, a huge, I mean, they, they push to the, an extreme limit um, the problem of means and ends. Uh, so in, in a sense, you know, you know, uh, Abraham is is placed into a situation of cons of doing the most heinous crime, the most unethical act, um, and being willing to do this. So having the intention and desire, and you know, um, and, uh, and and practical drive to do this. And so th the problem becomes: well, it, you know, if if in any description we can possibly offer from within the ethical framework, Abraham's activities aren't good they're bad um then how does this you know are, are we do we just reject abraham at this point and and how do we claim back abraham as the father of faith and it's precisely because the ethical realm is incapable of doing this um that kierkegaard begins to pose this particular problem now one solution of course is <coughs> that he's not that abraham is not part of the ethical um and that's because he's failed to even reach a kind of ethical position. He's he's not even sort of got there. He's essentially still part of the aesthetic. And here faith would be a kind of pre-intellectual, unknowing, unthinking, almost brute body response. Almost, we might say, animalistic, but that's problematic. But a response prior to intellect is... So on one hand, we might think, well, Abraham's decisions cannot be abraham's acts cannot be understood within the ethical because he didn't reach the ethical he was just doing something that everybody does all the time um, which is take an act do something they they act without thinking um, there is no thought behind this this is how we can understand abraham in which case um, as Kierkegaard says faith would never exist because it's always existed people are always doing this the, the, the people are always we might say taking actions um quite often acting before you think um what is it act in haste repent at leisure all that kind of stuff i mean people are aware of this and, and quite often um a lot of our actions are kind of a bit unthinking we just uh, habitual uh, activities or things things that someone else has prompted us and now those 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 are responses stimulus and response remember that kind of body thing those are things that still remain with and can be explained inside the realm of the aesthetic bottom realm um, and so whatever we think abraham is an example of obviously he's meant to be an example of faith if if what he's doing is just another act like anyone else you know that we do regularly then faith doesn't exist because it's always existed this is what kierkegaard says it can't just be a kind of response uh, that, uh, that an animal would make or something trained you know like a trained monkey would make um, you know he, that Abraham's relationship to Abraham going up on the mountain can't just be a kind of trained monkey relationship it can't be a trained monkey response and yet at the same time it can also can't be an ethical act 
and this is the kind of crux of Kierkegaard's problem, um, is reason's going to give only these kind of options. He's either going to have been, you know, reach the universal, reach the ethical, then he can give justification for what he's doing, or he's not reached that, in which case he's just doing something that's kind of pre-linguistic or pre-intellectual or, you know, unthinking. But for Kierkegaard, both of those options are impossible. We have to retain, he thinks, this concept of faith that is central to Abraham. But in order to do that, we now need to move beyond the ethical. Um, and so the teleological suspension of the ethical, the reason it's teleological suspension is because we're going to reconstitute the framework within which we describe Abraham's actions. Now, if you remember, the ethical realm is constituted teleologically by the good. Now we're going to teleologically suspend that and we're going to reconstitute the realm in which we describe what Abraham is doing. Not the aesthetic realm, not the ethical realm, but rather this religious realm. Uh, I'm inclined to take a break, but I think what I'm going to do, just relax a little bit. Um, I'll, I think we'll, we'll continue and I'll take a little bit of a break just before 8 o'clock, if that's all right. So... I've kind of gone on a little bit about that mediation and teleological stuff, so hopefully that's not completely, um, you know, uh, lacking in clarity now. I just want to, I think, briefly touch, very briefly, before we be before we go into the seminar, I want to briefly touch um, on a, a quote from Hegel. So I'm going to push this along. Uh, it's not actually a quote from Hegel. Let's put this more accurately. Where where are we? Let's get along. Uh, boom boom. Here we are. Uh, let's bring this up. So for just for the last bit of this lecture, I just want to briefly look at this particular quote. So this is from John Lippert, and it's his Routledge um, Philosophy Guidebook to Kierkegaard, Sphere and Trembling. I, we can have a copy of that put up onto River. Um, but it's a, it's a good kind of introduction to Fear and Trembling. It's worth looking at, and it's now begin. If you if you've been reading Fear and Trembling, it's now time that if you want to, you can begin looking at secondary work. Um, so, what Lippitt is doing here is trying to just trying to just distinguish. Remember, Hegel's kind of big background feature for Kierkegaard. He's trying to say Lippitt's trying to distinguish here um, the difference in approach. So Hegel's general line, Lippitt argues, is to argue that the attempt to attain freedom by ignoring or abolishing that which is felt to constrain one's true self, such as in Plato's anti-bodily asceticism, won't work. Rather, freedom lies in recognising what is felt as other than oneself as identical to oneself. When this other is public service, therefore, the solution is to recognise the contribution that public roles and commitments play in creating the self. The cares and commitments that I develop as a result of taking seriously my roles as husband, father and local doctor, for example, are an important part of my identity, my sense of myself. After all, could I even have an identity without some such roles? Now, here, what Lippitt's done is, is, is nice and succinctly kind of brought together this, this key thing inside Hegel and this key relationship to the singular. So the concrete individual in the kind of Hegelian system or the pre-Kierkegaard system, well, Kierkegaard doesn't have a system, so it's not pre-Kierkegaard system, it's kind of pre-Kierkegaard, the system prior to Kierkegaard. But that, that relationship between the individual and, uh, and the universal, the individual and the social, comes not by the tension between the two things being kind of pushed, but rather by being um, synthesised. Let's use that lovely Hegelian word. And so I find myself to be an individual um, in the roles, in the social roles in which I operate. I actually find myself as an individual in these roles, as he says, as husband or father or local doctor. Um, and so the roles aren't opposed to me. They're not external to me. They are, in fact, part of the way in which I am as a subject. I'm organised as an individual by these particular roles. Now, what Kierkegaard is going to try and, and do is essentially um, locate this particular realm that, that Hegel is talking about here, um, and, and he's going to, and essentially for Kierkegaard, it's the eth this is going to be the ethical realm. It's going to be the realm of the universal, the realm at which things can be explained, the realm at which we can uh, give reasons for what we're doing if we're asked, the realm at which we can kind of um, see roles, social organisation, social discipline as necessary for the, my own existence. And so I am insofar as we are. 
um, I am collective in this sense. I am part of a collectivity. Um, and my subjectivity is organised through this collective or social framework. Uh, and so um, I am essentially what society makes me in many ways. Now what Kierkegaard and the existentialists want to push back on is this idea that um, there is nothing of the individual or subjectivity outside of what the society makes. There is nothing of the individual or subjectivity outside of the social and universal, outside of the framework of language and social roles and ethics and norms produced by those societies. And so the individual is organised inside those universal frameworks as good or bad or strong or weak, courageous or fearful. But there's nothing really outside of this. Uh, the existentialists... All of that framework misses the absolute core and heart of what it is to be a subject. And for Kierkegaard in particular, it misses the core and heart of it. And the example of Abraham that, that John the Silent is offering us um, presents us with a case in which uh, the social, the, the roles that Hegel, Hegel is talking about, for example, presumably in the case of Abraham, it would be the father of faith or something like that, um, where these roles simply can't be can't be you know uh, can't be the organising forces because uh, there's no capacity, um, and this is crucial. There's no capacity for the act that Abraham is intending to take to be explained without sophistry as uh, ethically ethically good, ethically you know useful or socially useful or socially good. Um, the act he's taking may have some of those implications. It may it may produce something that has social positivity. Perhaps Kierkegaard would think that in terms of its production of Christianity, um, but the act itself can't be in a sense socially useful or can't be organised um, towards getting the good society to occur. The act itself produces only one thing. The act that Abraham takes produces Abraham. It produces Abraham more than anything else possibly could produce. It produces Abraham as um, a particular gesture at a particular moment in your life might produce the rest of you. All of you might be kind of organised around a single gesture, a single moment, a single no, a single yes, a single refusal or a single acceptance. All of these moments actually constitute you far more than the social roles and in Abraham's case absolutely constituted Abraham as Abraham prior to this he was just someone who had the name Abraham he wasn't the character the person the individual the singular Abraham it was only at the moment of the gesture only at the moment of that particular singular inexpressible uncommunicable unethical act with Isaac, that he became Abraham, an act that only he could carry out if he had faith, if he believed, literally, quite explicitly, in the impossible, not as something external to him, not as something out there in the beyond, but literally in the impossible, in the here and now. And if he believed in God, if he had faith, and if God made all things possible, including the impossible, then it would work out. But in order for it to work out, he had to be able to do a particular thing with all of the cost, all of the awareness, with full awareness of all the potential difficulties of that act. He couldn't do it quietly. He couldn't do it unconsciously. He had to do it with all of the infinite consequences. Now, I'll just finish the last couple of moments and then I'll start to set up the Zoom. So uh, I just want to finish with a question that I think can begin to help us work out some of what existentialism is trying to pursue, some of what Kierkegaard is trying to pursue when he's work, with his work on uh, Abraham. And that question is, does the subject have to be an individual? Does the subject have to be an individual? So let's assume for the moment that we have subjects and that we even assume that we are subjects for now. Let's assume this. I mean, there, we can challenge this in various different ways. Um, but there seems to be something intimately bound up with the idea of the subject and individuality, being an individual, being singular. Now, is it possible to conceive 
of a collective subject. Well, in a kind of sense it might be. Uh, politics, we talk about collective subjects like revolutionary subjects or collective subjects such as um, you know, women being subject to the power of the patriarchy, for example. Or the collective subject of children and childhood. So we might talk about subjects there, but we don't really mean, in that sense, subjectivity. We just mean um, things that aren't really fully objects that we're sticking in a category together. That's really what subject means there. So when I say, does the subject have to be an individual? Can subjectivity be anything other than an individual? Can it exist inside a collective? Can there be that kind of relationship of subjectivity? And what is it um, that seems to connect subjectivity to singularity, to the individual? Uh, this seems to be absolutely central for the existentialists um, and absolutely central for Kierkegaard and his relationship to Abraham. Um, and I think it's one of the ways in which we might sort of update the question I started the course with, which is how do I find myself in relationship to my knowledge and how do I find myself in relationship to truth? Um, well, I was trying to sort of suggest that existentialism is reflecting back on us, our own responses and activities in knowledge acquisition and in relationship to the truth. So how do I find myself in relationship to those things? Um, it's another way of kind of beginning to think the same kind of thing. Is it possible for me to conceive of myself as many? I mean, Deleuze and Guattari happily seemed to think this was easy. They, they declared in Anti-Oedipus and A Thousand Plateaus that they were many. Um, but the reality? Are, is subject, are you not always isolated, private, individual, separate, other than? If you weren't, presumably this other set of people who were around, they're all capable of accessing the inside of your mind or the inside of your work or the inside of you. I mean, how would this multiplicity ever work other than in a kind of metaphorical sense? The existentialist response, the existentialist impulse or instinct or, or guiding idea that there's a kind of huge potential of freedom and creativity located in this power of subjectivity is also bound up in many ways um, with a kind of co a, a, another idea that, that subjectivity is individual and so the power and the creativity of the subjectivity that, that capacity for subjectivity to be a source of value in the world always goes hand in hand it seems in existentialists with a kind of loss of togetherness of being with of um, you know, community and of collectivity. There's always a kind of acquisition of, of the power of subjectivity whilst at the same time a loss of collectivity because that power of subjectivity is so intimately connected to individuality. And for someone like Kierkegaard, this is made extremely explicit with relationship to Abraham because one of the things that's crucial here is that this kind of encounter with the act, the subjective act, such as Abraham's attempt to uh, the, the, Abraham's intention to sacrifice Isaac, the encounter with this particular act is inexpressible. It's beyond the capacity for us to collectivize it, um, and so it seems inherently deeply, deeply individual, and in such a way that the individual is kind of imprisoned in their subjectivity in that situation. Okay, that's it for tonight. Um, I'll catch you again next week if you're around. Um, that would be great. Nice to hear from you and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and I'll be opening up the Zoom um, seminar space for people in FUB now. Uh, and I suggest we take about, uh, we'll, we'll get going there about 10 past 8, uh, 5 past 10 past 8. So log on, have a chat, say hi, get yourself a coffee, um, and we'll be in the seminar. And so for the rest of you, um, thank you for hanging around, and um, I'll catch you another time. See you later.